Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here uh, talking about some very interesting subjects that have to do with pain. Uh, look, I've been a martial artist uh, most of my life, and there usually isn't a day in my life that I don't have some body part reminding me of those days. Uh, so today I have uh, called in a, a mixed martial arts legend to talk to us about his career and his use of da -da 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 -da, medical marijuana uh, in what it does for or pain and how it has helped him in his life. Uh, this to me is uh, really, it's, it's an important piece of this. And so, first of all, uh, you know, you've done so much. Welcome to the show. Frank Shamrock, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so give us a little bit of your background of how you got into the martial arts. Um, you know, everyone, everyone's got a different kind of inception story in this stuff. Sure, yeah, I started training when I was 22 years old. And um, I'd had a life of, of, of crime and issues and social dysfunction. And, um, you know, my group home dad uh, sat me down and was like, listen, you got to get serious about your life. You know, martial arts is a way. And uh, he basically dropped me off at the gym when I was 22 years old. And then I never left. Wow. So you, you found it. You loved it. But it was it like so you said your life, life of crime. So you had you had some things that you needed to get together and then martial arts kind of pulled you in and, and became a lifestyle for you? Totally, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a broken home and, um, you know, home of abuse and addiction. And so I learned that crime was a vehicle to, you know, achieving success in life. And it wasn't until, you know, I turned 18 and that became an adult conversation that I realized I needed to change my life. And I just had no tools. I had no education. I had no opportunity. Um, and martial arts, you know, was the opportunity. My dad, you know, wisely, you know, gave me the dad talk and, you know, took me to the program. And what kind of martial art was it when you first got going? I was studying submission wrestling and uh, pancreation style, which was underneath my brother, uh, Ken Shamrock. He had learned the style in Japan. Uh, they were competing in a Japanese organization called Pancrase, which was a... Uh, um, one of the roots of the UFC that is today. And uh, from there, did you just get into all the mixed martial arts uh, strategy? I mean, you go from wrestling and then you go into, I mean, you got to learn how to punch, you got to learn how to kick. You don't know what's coming at you on, in that octagon, right? Yeah. And for me, you know, I, I approached it very scholastically because, um, you know, I was quite a student. I really enjoyed studying and you know, I, could, I figured out early on that it was, you know, an underdeveloped art. People didn't really know how to mix all these things together and, you know, create a style. There was a lot of theories. There was a lot of, you know, tough guys. Um, but it was great for me because I was a student and I sat down and I, and I studied it. Um, and, you know, I came up with some really good theories and some really good ideas that I eventually turned into my own style. And I was very successful at it. What, what years were you in? I mean, I'm assuming you're not competitively fighting anymore. What years? No, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm retired. But uh, so from 1994 until 2010, I was a professional athlete and, and competitive uh, for 16 years. Wow, that is a long run, man. That's a lot. That's a lot of body damage. 16 oh, years is a lot man. of work. Yeah, and I mean, for, for a lot of people who aren't in the martial arts, um, it, we, I think we could both confirm that getting punched in the face sucks, right? Yep. And and you know, it doesn't get much better. And so you, you get you get better at defending yourself, but you don't you don't block every punch. And so you know, that's, that's a lot of damage to the body uh, over that many years. Um, and so as you started getting better, um, I'm assuming you, you know, won a lot and you, you know, your name is, your name is out there. I mean, you've obviously made a great name for yourself. Um, the, the stuff that people don't talk about when you're up there hoisting a, you know, host, hoisting a trophy or a belt is, you know, what it's going to feel like the next morning. Uh, right. And, and it hurts, man. It really hurts. So when did you start to feel kind of your mortality? You know, so you, you, know, you shake off a fight and after a while it's like, you know, you, you move on. At what point did you just realize that like this gift that keeps on giving is, is still with you? It was in my early 30s. I started getting hurt to the point where, you know, it wouldn't just heal from ice and massage and stuff like that. Um, and it really started, you know, opening my eyes to... Uh, you know, just the violence in the sport. It was, it's an incredibly violent and dangerous sport. I was very lucky when I was young because I was so strong and so athletic. Uh, but yeah, about 32 or three, things started falling apart. Um, the need for pain management, medicine, therapy, 
you know, tripled, quadrupled um, until, you know, at the latter stages of my career, most of my training was therapy, you know, just dealing with the, you know, the damage that's being done to me so that I can do my job. Yeah. Yeah. And your job requires being flexible, agile, uh, you know, quick response, having fast twitch muscles, being able to, you know, be there in the moment. And, you know, when a body part doesn't respond when you need it to, that's a problem when, you know, someone's coming after you. Uh, just out of curiosity, like what, what body parts at first started to uh, kind of fall out? Like, where, you know, was it ligaments, tendons, muscles? Like, what, where did you start feeling the drag at first? Well, first thing was my knees and my hips. Because besides all the martial arts, uh, when I was 16, I was diagnosed with scoliosis and a spondylithiosis in my lower spine. So I'd broken one of my vertebrae at some point. Uh, so there's tremendous tension in my lower back, my hips. Everything sort of overcompensates for this lack of muscular uh, or this lack of spinal stability. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, by the time I was 30, I was in horrible pain. And, you know, I was getting, you know, prescriptions and recommendations for really powerful painkillers. Um, you know, that would not leave me in a position to do business and communicate and work on camera. Uh, so I had to start looking for alternatives to, to my pain management. Yeah. And so what did you try? I'm assuming everything, Cairo, acupuncture, everything. everything. Anything, everything, the newest technology. I mean, you name it, I've tried it. You know, just when you're in pain, when you're in constant pain and your job is to perform, you, know, you just, you got to stop the pain, you know, otherwise your job just sucks. Right. Right. And, you know, even if you can't go to your job, everything sucks anyways. And the pain, yeah. you know, pain's always there. That's the, that's the hard part. So at what point did you look at marijuana as uh, a remedy um, and did it start working immediately? Well, it was really in my 30s that I started getting caught up with the science. You know, I'd used it recreationally. I'd used it even through self-medication for my own pain and discomfort. But I didn't really, you know, know the science of it or you know, I hadn't been exposed to it until like my early 30s and when sort of the, you know, all this technology and all these, you know, research studies started coming out. And at that time I had a, you know, I felt very guilty about using this illegal substance, you know, for, for any purpose because it's illegal. Uh, but it wasn't until, yeah, I was like 32 and I'm like, wait a minute, this is real medicine. Like this is real medicine, stopping pain, you know, curing things. Um, and I struggled with myself internally, but I started taking it and it was night and day different. I mean, I could sleep, I could rest, my appetite came back. When you're in pain all the time, you don't want to eat mm -hmm. because it hurts. You don't feel hungry. Mm -hmm. So I was like night, instantly, you know, my appetite came back. My tension was, you know, minimized. Uh, and I found it to be just night and day different between what they were giving me pharmaceutically and what I could do naturally through pain, you know, through ice and heat. Uh, adding the cannabis made all the difference in the world. So let me get this straight. So, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, just personal bias. I, th I think that there's a lot of promise here, and I think that it's uh, a wonderful alternative to big pharma and kind of na narco drugs, right? Uh, and you know, and the jury's out. You know, it's not, it's not a hundred percent. I mean, there's some studies right. that say you know it can mess with your brain and all that. But if you're in excruciating pain and you're taking Percocet and you have an opp opportunity to take cannabis, I mean, it is, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. So were you able to pull off the other pain meds and do basically cannabis with ice and, ice and stretching and massage, or were you still on some of the, the, um, the other kind of more potent ones as well? No, I mean, I, I dabbled in them for a very short period of time in that, you know, my pain was through the roof. They were giving me these drugs, and I was saying, there's gotta be other ways, like this is, you know, these are hardcore drugs. Um, and I was very lucky to have mentors who had struggled with addictions and who had mm -hmm. been down this journey. So, you know, they were the ones going, listen, you know, this thing is a dead end. You end up a drug addict, you know, with this horrible pain. Um, and so I, I knew right away, like, we gotta find some natural alternative to this mm -hmm. and something that's not gonna damage me, you know, to stop my pain. And cannabis, every time, you know, every time, um, you know, you can rely on it. It's, you know, it doesn't wipe you out. There's no hangover. You're not like it's a, a legitimate, you know, painkiller medicine that it just when I started consuming it, it changed my whole physical structure because I didn't have to, you know, hold back because I was in pain. I could be more of the athlete that I thought I was, but the pain was sort of stopping me because I, hmm. you know, it only felt like I could go so far with this pain. 
Hmm. Have you been playing with it? There's so many. Like I've had a couple guys on the show. They're talking about all these different delivery vehicles now, between dab, okay. dabs and you know edibles to all sorts of new you know forms of vapor. What seems to work best? Is there a THC CBD combo? Like what what what's the magic formula for a guy like you? Well, for me, and it's different for everybody. Yeah. And this is where your personal medicine journey you know needs to be examined. Um, but for me, I have excruciating pain. And I need to manage that all throughout the day. I use a vaporizer. I use the volcano vaporizer. So I'm not burning anything or combusting anything in my lung, which, by the way, is the worst way to consume it. Um, I'm breathing in a, a heated plant matter. So uh, it goes right into my system. It's very quick. Uh, it lasts for six to eight hours for pain management. And, um, yeah, I'm not smoking anything. That's, that's why, you know, this... America needs to kind of catch up to this medicine mm. because I mean they're still talking about smoking weed and it's like that is the worst mm. and least you know viable way to consume mm -hmm. this medicine. Mm -hmm. There's so many better ways for you to consume it that you know have longer lasting effects that are better for your body overall and that that attack the pain better as well. Yep. So how do you manage the the high? Right, so a lot of people, you know, have a hard time functioning and kind of running their yeah. days. And look, you know, getting getting high and having a good time—that's one thing. But like, you're you're in an office building right now. I'm sure you got shit going on, right? And so, like, how are you managing the pain while managing the psychoactive components of it, so that you can kind of navigate in in, in the real world? Sure. Well, that's a great question, and it's one we hear quite often. Is and I think that's where the overwhelming misconception is. Mm. I'm not getting high, and most of these times, I'm not high at all. Um, but you need a little bit of THC with that CBD right. to make it work for you. Okay, so, so, so you're, you're taking a high CBD version yeah. with some THC to activate some of the, the, yeah. the different compounds. Yeah, so it's very rare that I'm getting lightheaded, I'm Got feeling. It. Like there's, it's very rare, and sometimes it happens. Um, but unlike the Percocet, I'm not zoned out for six hours. You right. know, I'm just, it lasts for 30 minutes. I'm like, whoa, that was too much. Right. Um, but it's a, it's a much more manageable pain, you know, tolerance sort of experience. And everybody's different. I think that's a lot of the, the problems with cannabis is it's hard to get a consistent, you know, strain that affects people in a certain way. A lot of people have good trips, bad trips, good medicine, bad medicine. So there's a lot of, you know, mystery about it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why we're doing this talk show, the Bake Out Show. It's like, we need to have real conversations about this because, you know, we can't keep this culture of misinformation especially when there's people that really need this medicine. Mm -hmm. Totally. I was just in uh, Boulder, Colorado for business, and I stayed an extra few days uh, to go skiing in Vail. And the guy, uh, the guy I was with like, is a CBD guy. And he's like, come on, I'm going to stop by a smoke shop. I'm going to pick up some CBD. And so I, and I'm from California. Technically, it's legal here, but we don't have an industry quite yet. Like the law hasn't you know, kind of clicked in. And so it was my first um, kind of smoke shop experience. And I walked into this thing going like, holy crap, man. It's like a store and like it's very well articulated and people here like, you know, like there's displays and people like, it was unbelievable how much knowledge and wisdom there was uh, kind of attributed to, to this, this whole industry that like I had no idea about. So I think, you know, people who don't live in Colorado and a couple of these kind of early adopter states have no idea about much of this, right? And that's part of it. That's probably why you're doing your show. Yeah, because the, the, the general conception is we're smoking weed, we're smoking grass. Um, and, you know, that's been the general conception for like 50 years. But it's like with technology now, with the ways to consume it, with what we understand about it, like we've just gone so much further than that. And we need to educate the people as well as, you know, some onus goes back on to the people in this industry. It's time to stop talking about smoking weed. Mm -hmm. and it's time to stop living in the Cheech and Chong era. Because we're way past that. This is a legitimate medicine mm -hmm. that's now being studied. Millions of dollars are going towards the study of it. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see over the next five to ten years a tremendous influx of information coming out of these studies that that give a very positive you know, support to the cannabis medicine. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it was, what, like the 40s, a lot of this stuff got kind of shuttled out, and Israelis did a bunch of the, uh, of the research, and right now is it AG Pharmaceuticals. There's... 
tens of millions of dollars being put into this industry now because people understand that guys like you who have pain are actually reporting much better tolerance, much better pain relief than all of these kind of n narco meds that are addictive, right? And so that, that to me is really interesting. Like, so you look down the barrel of a lifestyle of someone who has chronic pain and you look at opioid addictions uh, and, and it's just, it's inevitable that if you start using them, it's going to become a problem if you're not very, very careful or your genes are just, you're just lucky, right? So how many people in your industry do you know that were stuck in some op opioid downward spiral? Pick, pick, pick them. I mean, I think everybody experiences it. And you know, it's your coaches, it's your community, it's your family, you know, that wakes you up because mm -hmm. you don't know. Your doctors are giving you this stuff. You're in horrible pain. Right. Uh, you know, we've got a problem in our culture you know, we're masking pain, you know, we're taking painkillers, you know, we're not taking things to, to fix us, mm -hmm. you know, we're not taking action to solve it, right. you know, we're taking things to numb it, to kill it, to, you know, put it to the side, and it's like, that's where, you know, that's where cannabis has so much hope, all these pills they give you are highly addictive, mm -hmm. you know, we are giving our people addictive painkillers, and that just... It makes no sense for anybody but the pharmaceutical companies. Yep. Like that's the only person that it makes sense for in this day and age. You know, the guy that changed my stars when I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at UCLA uh, pre-med, um, I was working in a, a pain medicine center, and you know, all these people would get carted in uh, in pain and get carted out, doped up on morphine, and I was just like, "What are we doing? Like, how do we fix this?" And he's like, "We this is all we got, right?" And this is you know back in, you know, back in the '90s, like this is all we got, and it just changed my. I was like, "I'm out," right? I went went into Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and and you know, f tried to find other remedies, but so th there's also you know the core issue, right? So you have now something that's non-addictive that's helping you with your pain. That's wonderful. But you've got a spondylolisthesis and you've got probably a couple herniations and some things going on in the low back and the hip. Um, and, and, and fixing that is a much more complicated matter, right? Like those, those are very difficult things to kind of turn around and correct. So have you done any sort of intervention there to kind of turn that around? Or has the cannabis shifted the dynamic to the point where like everyday life is cool? Well, everyday life is cool now. And that just took some time. It took me about seven years to kind of heal all the horrible things I did to myself. Mm. Uh, but with that said, now I feel great. As long as I don't do anything crazy or take tremendous impact, you know, I feel really, really good. And what I'm hoping for and waiting for is the technology to catch up. You know, because much like, you know, slap tears and shoulder surgery, stuff like that, you know, they should be able to do this surgery soon, you know, orthoscopically, to where they don't have to cut me open and cage my spine and all these other things. So I'm fingers crossed waiting for technology to catch up with me. Um, but I certainly don't want to be addicted to, you know, all these other stuff in the meantime. Got it. So for me, it's a, I can manage it. I keep my core strong. You know, I have exercises that I do every single day. And as long as I don't do, you know, X and Y, I'm perfectly fine. Right. And like a normal person. And that's something I think a lot of people need to know is like, so if you had a single level herniation, I think the, the latest statistic still is about 50. 50% of those people go back for a second surgery. And yeah. that's not a guy who's like been through the blender. You know what I mean? Like, so you've got a bunch of things going on there. It probably is, it ain't that pretty as a single, you know, clear herniation. So therefore the surgery makes very little sense unless you have numbness uh, or debilitating like loss of bowel or bladder control and stuff that like means, you know, dude, you need a surgery right now. So if there's something that could hold you off and buy you that time, you're right. Look, every year, the technology is getting better every year. The surgeries are getting better, so you're you're, you're in, a, in a pretty spot because it's not a race against time with an addictive substance. Yeah, and that's where it's like, you know, give me a natural medicine that I can take my whole life, and it not destroy me because I'm 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 a patient. The rest yeah. of my life, I will be a patient. I need to manage this thing. Yeah. Um, and even if I get the surgery, this is why I haven't had the surgery. Every doctor who said, yeah, get, it's going to be great. And then you'll be a patient afterwards. Right. Then you have to deal with surgery and the medicines that are needed to get through that. So it's like either way you go, I'm a patient. I need to care for myself. And do I take risk or do I do it naturally and, you know, manage my own pain and my own health success? Yeah. Love it. Have you, uh, have you gotten into now that, now that, you know, the, the kind of the big bruiser days are over and you know, you know, you're not in, in the ring taking punches or delivering them, uh, Tai Chi or Qigong, some of the softer arts. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, as as a martial artist, you know, your art evolves as your body ages. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm doing some nice stuff now. Um, it took about four years off after the healing in the midst of the healing. Actually, I just I took some martial arts time off to kind of restructure sort of my whole existence in life. Um, but yeah, now I'm back to doing some deep meditations, a little bit of Qigong, a little bit of energy movements. Um, but I mean, I thought for certain I would die fighting in a cage in some foreign country, you know, in some crazy, you know, knockdown drag out fight. Mm. So everything after that career has just been a blessing. And, you know, the fact that I can manage my own, you know, pain and healthcare, that I'm healthy and, you know, it's just, I feel so blessed. How have you changed as a guy? Like, so I'm always curious about guys who get into the martial arts and what drove you. I mean, I was put in the martial arts because I was just a monkey. Like, I was just ADD and I was put in as a kid. So it was just part of my culture. I came to it early, but it wasn't for fighting reasons. It was more for discipline reasons, right? You got in at 22 because life, you know, was different, right? And you had to make different choices. What fueled you in that, in that cage? What fueled you in there? Was it anger? Was it survival? Like, what, what was the primal energy that drove you all those years survival pure survival at first it was you know don't get beat right. <laughs> or beat up and then after that you know it was win because i realized you know this was my ticket you know this was my this fighting thing was my opportunity um and most people you know they don't get that opportunity mm -hmm. so you know where a lot of people you know they had families they had support you know i had none of that so i knew you know, my success would be built on, you know, my time performing in the martial arts. So, you know, I put everything into it and I always, you know, performed like I was going to die in some foreign country. And I think that's why a lot of people were, you know, compelled by my brand and followed me and stuff because the fighting was pretty, was pretty awesome. And you, so you fought with your back against the wall and, and you yep. fought, you fought for survival. What was your record, by the way? 27 and... Ten and something. And uh, I had a lot of fun. titles, ti <laughs> yeah, titles that you held. I was the first ever UFC middleweight champion and retired from there undefeated. I won the World Extreme Cage Fighting Championship at heavyweight. I won the Strike Force middleweight champion, and I'm sure I won some more stuff. But there was a lot of belts and stuff. That a lot I of won. belts. A lot of belts. You can only you can only wear one at a time, and you know. Those, belts, those yeah. belts aren't designed to keep your pants up either. They're heavy. Yeah. Currently, <laughs> they, they occupy space in my garage and a nice clear bed. Somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good to, good to know you still have them. <laughs> so for someone who's fighting pain right now and someone who is struggling with uh, you know, the, the prescriptions that, you know, doctors are better, you know, the good doctors are really reluctant to script this stuff out because they know, we know this is a problem. But if someone's struggling from pain right now, how do you get into this conversation with your doctor? How do you get access to medical cannabis? And how do you learn what is right for you? Because, you know, I, get, I think most people are stuck in Cheech and Chong. And so, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I need a resource if I need to, you know, if I think this is going to work for me. Yeah, I think the first thing is to be real with your doctor. Because a lot of doctors are hip to this sort of medicine. My mm -hmm. doctor was. My doctor was one of the first ones who said, listen, you can't keep taking those pills. You need to you know, think long term here. Mm -hmm. So definitely disclose this to your doctor and talk to them about it because you know, they, they need to hold your hand in this. And then after that, you know, it really is a personal experience. You know, you, the uses are pretty defined. You know, what it does or is supposed to do is pretty defined. So you can find your strain, you can find your oil or whatever it is you need to kind of alleviate your thing. But every body's different, like we talked earlier, every absorption is different. And you really need to find what your personal medicine is. And I think this maybe is what is scaring, you know, both big pharma and, and the general public. Imagine if you could control all of your own medicine. Imagine if you could plant a seed in your backyard and provide medicine for your family. That's a you know, that's a, a thought that's it's really empowering, uh, but also, you know, damaging to big pharma, to other industries that rely on medicine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and so they're hedging their bet. And I think there's a lot of big pharma money coming into medical marijuana. There's a lot of cannabis, you know, investment happening right now. If you can't beat them, join them. 
Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, look, gold standard, grow your own food, grow your own medicine, and, you know, screw all of it, right? But, you know, a lot of us live in a market economy where we need people to grow it and, pro and provide it. And now we're in a weird space. I mean, I think someone's telling me Philip Morris pat patented the joint. You know what I mean? And there's, there's all kinds of, you know, interests coming into this space uh, for recreational and medicinal. So it is kind of wild, wild west. But... Look, I mean, you found your blend. You found something that works for you. Uh, you're obviously not high as a kite. You're on a CBD blend. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so, and you could function, right? And yeah. you're functioning, and you're you're doing well with it. So, so what I'm hearing is, find it, experiment with it, and find a blend that works for you is kind of the the way now. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. And you know, like I was saying, this, you know, we've identified you know, the core sort of human ailments that this does, you know, attack or help with. So it's like, you know, if you have hunger, if you have pain, if you have issues, you know, there's a specific strain, there's a variety that will kind of fill that need for you. But it is a personal journey. You gotta find how to consume it, what ways you're comfortable with. A lot of people, especially with the edibles, have a negative experience, they consume too much, then they're kind of afraid to go back, they don't have a good experience. So you, you kind of need, a little support, a little hand holding, uh, and that's really what our TV show is about. I'm, I'm, I've been consuming this plant, you know, for 20 plus years, but I've only learned in the past year or so, you know, just the science of it, the technology of it, and I'm like a super nerd. So if I don't know, imagine what the rest of America doesn't know. Sure. Sure. Well, the rest of America thinks it's evil, right? Like the old right. Mary, you know, we had a, we had a, a guy on the show who was talking about how like cannabis was rebranded as marijuana because there was this isolationist thing that was happening when they didn't want Mexican immigrants to come in, and yeah. you know, the, the whole thing. It's just like it's it's a hilarious saga of a story that's you know a politicized plant, and so there's a lot of you know. Good, bad, and ugly. I mean, I don't want teenage kids, you know, smoking dope and not doing their math homework. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a high CBD blend that is incredible for pain, that isn't psychoactive and is doing wonderful things for someone who would otherwise be at risk of being an addict already on painkillers. Yeah, and when you look at, you know, the controversy behind this plant, when you look at the dual positions of our own government, you know, we our government holds a patent on it but also calls it a schedule one drug with no uses whatsoever medically. So there's, you know, two different positions and the people are in the middle. They're the ones not getting medicine, you know, being fed misinformation and, you know, frankly, being fed, you know, pharmacopoeia instead of natural plants, you know, which is, we sort of evolved on this earth by using mother earth to care for us. And, you know, as people, we need to get back to some of those things like protecting our earth, consuming our own medicine, understanding what that medicine is. Because if you don't know what's going in your body, you don't know what's going to happen to you. Yep. Amen, brother. Amen. That's it. And, and, and the plants are wise and the plants are teachers. And, you know, it's, it's time to really kind of revisit that uh, culturally. Frank, what is the TV show? Where can people see it? Where can people find your work? Sure. You can find it online at the bakeout, uh, bakeout.tv. And we are an online show because it is actually illegal to do a show like this on a network um, broadcasting channel. So we're bucking the trend a little bit, but everything will be online, bakeout.tv. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're having real conversations about it. Our first guest is just, when you see it, it'll floor you, drop you to your knee. You know, it's a young woman who has basically taken her own health in her hands and saved her own life. Yeah, you know what? There, there needs to be more and more of those stories getting cameras on them. So I'm glad you're doing what you're doing because there's there's stories like that all over, but you don't hear about them. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, yeah, especially especially when pharma commercials are blasting uh, between your regular program network TV. So yeah, phar pharma has overstretched into the media. They control the airwaves and they fund a lot of the TV out there. So this is this is real grassroots, no pun intended. And uh, you know, it's important that you're doing this work. So man, so again, bake the bake out. Dot TV? Bakeout. Bakeout. Dot TV. Bakeout.tv. Frank Shamrock. Legend, man. Thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing. And I'm really glad to see you on the other side of this with, you know, like just good cognition and, you know, like your, your, your brain is with it and you're doing good stuff for the world. So you really, you really got out of, you know, that career and into the next in a way that, that, that's, you know, positive. And I, and I thank you for it. That, that, that means a lot. Oh, thank you. 
Yeah, this is great. So, hey, you know, the moral of the story here is plant medicine, uh, good medicine, if you could apply it the right way, find your balance, find your medicine, and look for examples in the world of people that are doing things that are supportive of their own health. And look, you know, we just had a very good example of someone who has seen a lot and taken a lot of punishment in the body who is now thriving because of a plant medicine. So let's take a look at this. Let's be open-minded about it and let's look at things objectively. Let me know what you think and if you have any of the resources or stories you want to share, put them in the chat thread here. This is Dr. Pedram Shojai. I will see you next time.